So our uh, uh, first talk of the last session is Yoni Parabainen, and he will tell us about almost primes in short intervals. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you all for coming here. So I'll tell you about a problem that I've been thinking about every once in a while for several years now, and that's the problem of almost primary short intervals. Um, and before I start with that, let me explain to you what's known about primes and shells in short intervals. So the primary theorem tells us that the number of primes to x is asymptotic to x over log x, which means that the, in particular, the average gap between primes is about log x. But so what we would really like to understand is how big is the maximal gap between primes up to x, or how big is the almost maximal gap if you're allowed to throw away an epsilon proportion of bad intervals where you don't know what happens, what can you say about the lattice gap between primes? And there's a conjecture which predicts exactly how large those gaps would be. So the conjecture goes from probabilistic heuristics. And so for the maximal gap, it says that intervals of length a constant type log x squared mm -hmm. contain primes for any large enough x. And for the problem of looking at almost all intervals, if you take any function linked to infinity, so you could take log 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 of x, um, then almost all intervals of length psi x log x contain primes or almost all x. And let me spell out what I mean by almost all x. So I mean that the asymptotic density of x, obviously you don't have this property, tends to zero as you go to infinity. So um, look at the number of x up to x such that property. Go back to the yeah, that's right. Then this proportion of intervals which don't contain uh, primes tends to zero as x to infinity. Okay, so that's what I mean by almost all. And that's the notion that we use a lot in this talk. This is not Markov's inequality from the fact that the average prime gap is longer. Uh, no, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> things will be a lot simpler. But, uh, no, unfortunately not. Um, okay, so as I said, this conjecture falls from a probabilistic heuristic. So let me briefly explain what the heuristic is. Um, so that's what's called the Fermat random model. <clears throat> and it basically says that the prime should behave randomly. So the primes should behave like a random set of density one over log x up to x. Okay. If we just assume that this is true, then you can easily compute all sorts of probabilities. So you can compute that the probability that um, an interval of length lambda times log x contains no primes 
Well, that's by elementary probability. If we assume the series stick, it will be one minus one over log x to the power of lambda log x with e to the minus lambda. And so if you plug in here, lambda equals psi of x or any function tending to infinity, you get something that tends to zero. So probability zero that you don't have. Um, property, and if you take lambda equals a constant times log x, you get x to the minus c. And then by Borough Cantelli, you expect that there are no exceptional intervals, because this is less than 1 over x. Um, and in fact, this prediction, as you can guess from d to the minus lambda, it predicts that the prime gaps would be Poissonian. So the random variable of how many primes you have on such an interval should be Poissonian with parameter lambda. Now, unfortunately, we know nothing like that. Um, but we can still ask what can be said about primes in sort intervals, either unconditionally or if we assume the real hypothesis. Okay, so, <laughs> so the question is how slowly growing a function f can we take such that um, intervals of length fx around x? contain primes. And there's two regimes to consider. You can either look at all x or all multiple x. So for all x, we know that intervals of length x to the 7 over 12 contain primes, even with the correct asymptotic. This is the result of Huxley from 72 with slight improvement due to E Brown. Now, if you only want a lower bound and not asymptotic, you can do a bit better. So x to the 0 0.525 is a sort of in interval length that's known to always contain primes unconditionally. So this is by the from Fins. One. What do you mean by asymptotic to number of uh, Yeah, so for intervals from x to uh, x plus x to the 7 over 12, one can get the asymptotic formula for how many primes they contain. But for the sort of intervals, it's only a lower bound for the number. Um, okay, so one can also ask what about under the Riemann hypothesis? And there, best known. Interval length is x to the one half times log x. So this is under three hypothesis. Um, so even under our rates, we're nowhere near the um, prediction that Cormier made about the uh, interval length. Is okay. it equivalent to our age? Um, not quite, I guess. Um, it, yeah, yeah. It's short interval not to be. The, just to go to zeros. You can have one zero off, it doesn't hurt you. Yeah, yeah it's not, not, not a vehicle. Right? That's exactly why you can prove a zero. Yeah. Um, okay, so one can then look at almost all x. There, the results are a bit better, but still not anywhere near Cromwell. So, Intervals of length x to the 1 over 20 plus epsilon are known to contain primes almost always. So this is a result of Gia from 96. And under RH, one can now get relatively close to Cromer's prediction. So Interval length log x to 2 plus epsilon under the human hypothesis. So that's an old result. What did Selberg do? So what did Selberg do? He proved exactly this oh. under our eyes. Yeah. Um, okay, so as we can see from this table, 
the results are still quite far from the conjecture, in particular, the unconditional results. So as usual in mathematics, if you can't solve a problem, you relax it until you can solve it. And that's where the almost primes come into play. Um, okay, so what do I mean by an almost prime? I simply mean a number with a given small number of prime factors. So I'm going to call EK the set of numbers that have exactly K prime factors. So in particular, E2 is what's usually just called the semi primes. So repetition is allowed. Uh, yeah. Repetition is allowed. Yeah, repetition is allowed. Yeah. Um, okay, so turns out the um, okay, so why is it a good idea to study the EK number? So E2 is not uh, a prime is not allowed, right? You really want two primes. Yeah, it has to be exactly really want, yeah. that's where the, where the E is. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be easier if you allowed both primes and semi primes. Changes. Yeah. Okay, so why is it natural to consider almost primes as an approximation to the primes? Um, well, one thing is that they have a similar density, so the density is up to log log factors, same as the primes. Another reason is that um, if the similar obstructions or difficulties come up in when trying to study these numbers in short intervals, um, in particular, the zeros of the real zeta play a role, as we saw with the primes. And secondly, I won't go into it, but there's something called the parity problem in number theory, which prevents sieve methods, which are otherwise very useful from detecting this kind of numbers in short intervals. And the exact same thing happens for the primes. So kind of the same difficulties are present here, but there's more flexibility from having extra prime factors. Okay, so now we, we can ask the same question for the k numbers. So this is the interesting part, what we can say about them. So firstly, let's look at all intervals. Here we can do intervals of length x to d 0.55 plus epsilon with as a plot. <laughs> so this is by Matomaki and myself from 2019. So for any k? Uh, this is, yeah, this is where k equals 2. Yeah, that's two. Yeah. Uh, so E2 yeah. number, semi primes. Yes, yes, yes. Semi yeah. Yeah. And I think your A will be better. Yeah, uh, you'll see in a moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the bigger K is the better. Um, so the exponent for the primes here was 7 over 12, which is about 0 0.58. And for E3 numbers, so products of three primes, we can do x to the one half log x to. 1.55. So this is a theorem of Matamaki and myself from this year. So we get quite close to the x to the one half log x. Uh, and this is for k equals three. That is the best known result for the primes under the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, what about almost all x? So note that these results are still very far from log squared of x, which was the conjecture. But for almost all x, we can do um, log x to the power 2.1 <laughs> with semi primes. So it's finally getting to the logarithmic regime. And you can still ask, what about E3 numbers? Can we then get even closer to the um, predicted interval length? 
And indeed we can. So um, for E3 numbers, one can do intervals of length. Um, log x times a power of double log. So up to a double log, it's as good as t on the extra edge. And if one increases k further, you would get sort of iterated logs here. I prove a theorem that if you have e k numbers, you can put here a k minus one iterated log. So it's getting closer and closer to the predicted interval length. And the results under the Riemann hypothesis would be exactly the same as for the primes. Um, okay, so kind of the um, conclusion is that when you work with works of two primes, you get extra flexibility for the factorization. And that's the eventual reason why we can get much better results. And with that, I'd like to conclude. But he asked you um, about Markov's inequality, and in fact, Sobo's proof is just a variance computation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So all of these almost all results are oh, okay. down to computing the variance okay. and then yeah. applying Fourier analysis to compute it with the variance. So it is, yeah, so it's all about variance. You're right. You say, oh, is or big enough? Uh, sorry? When you say or x, it's all yeah, all big enough, all big enough x. We don't have a bound necessarily for the uh, point from which over it, it occurs, but some some number. Yeah. What about the maximal gap between two elements in forty k? Has this been studied? Like, uh, um, like uh, you mean the all, the all, all intervals from yeah, so something analogous to this main are green of. Uh, Oh, like, like yeah, finding the max nearby the lower block, so, lower block yeah. or the max. But like finding tuples of uh, E2 numbers. Uh, there's some papers of Gold and Pinson Yildirim about that. Actually, before the um, meta Tau and Zam breakthroughs. So even before that, they could do um, some tuples of E2 numbers. So like boundary gaps between E2 numbers. No, but the other direction, so maximal gap. So oh, right. Yeah, like with. Um, Made us work and for the yes, green cognac game. So is that tau? Um, okay. I'm not aware of any results, but uh, uh, yeah, I haven't seen any such papers. But what was it? Question. With the green, with the Goldstone work, they have to allow E2 and G2, I forget what they call them, because they're doing, uh, they're changing the so in order, they, they, they're going to produce either products of two primes or a prime, just like in Chen's work. Here. I think they actually get products of two primes. Uh, not in the strongest result. Uh, they have to, uh, we can discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you.